Hey, I'm Dave Hardigan from uh, Twin Cities Orthopedics. I'm here to talk to you about the knotless compression bridge for abductor tendon repair. The abductor tendons have often been referred to as the rotator cuff tear of the hip. Uh, and I think that this is because they tend to happen in patients in their sixth decade of life, which is similar. They tend to be more chronic attritional type tears, which is also similar to rotator cuffs. It's much more common in women than in men, and that's likely due to the slightly wider pelvises that women have. And then they're divided into two main subgroups full thickness tendon tears and partial thickness tendon tears. We're gonna focus mostly here on the partial thickness tendon tears. This is a full thickness tendon tear. I'm showing this basically because these tend to start at that lateral facet, anterior facet junction, and they move from deep to superficial. Here you can see it's a full thickness tear. You can see hem hemosiderin deposition in the tendon, noting that it's a chronic tear. It's notable that some of these also have vastus tendon pathology, and so if I do a double row repair, I'll oftentimes put a 475 swivel lock in that vastus tubercle to pull those edges back over. This is more what we're talking about today, which denotes the junction of the anterior and the lateral facet. You see bubbling of that tendon tissue. That bubbling is obviously under surface tendon tear. And I think that this is something that is extremely amenable to the suture tendon compression bridge technique. How do these present? Well, I always like to rule out other concomitant pathology. Uh, if they have back problems, this can be like an L5, S1. If they have lower extremity issues or walking in a boot for prolonged periods of time or have gait changes from knee issues, oftentimes they'll get some tr tr uh, transient trochanteric bursitis, you can get moralgia parasitica, piriformis syndrome, ischiofemoral impingement, and then fibromyalgia and things of that nature. So making sure it's not those things is every bit as important as making sure what it is. Uh, aside of hip pain, it tends to be a dull ache. These patients often will complain that when they roll over at night, it's extremely hard for them. They'll wake up multiple times at the night. Harder mattresses are worse than softer mattresses. They have weakness in abduction and this is something that you really have to do a good job of testing. If you bring them into the lateral decubitus position, um, oftentimes they'll kind of slouch backwards uh, and they'll externally rotate their leg, which will make it more of a hip flexor test. So you gotta make sure that their pelvis is straight up and down. And then you wanna make sure you internally rotate the leg, which gets variable contributions from the medius and minimus depending on the amount of internal rotation. You want to look at Trend Ellenberg signs, so single leg stance. If their pelvis sways toward the contralateral side, that's a positive. Pain can radiate down the leg, and this can be due to a frayed tendon, which can cause irritation to the IT band or the vastus lateralis pathology that we discussed. Um, they localize the pain to the various facets, and so I get them on the table, I map out the anterior lateral and posterior superior facets and basically palpate those areas. And then the positive internal rotation test. And so the only internal rotator with the hip at 90 is the gluteal muscles. And so if they're really weak or really painful, oftentimes that can be a good hint. And I also use injections to ensure that this is the area of problem. We did a study looking at imaging pearls, and so what things to look for on a general radiograph that can help you kind of make the diagnosis. And what we found is these lateral enthesophytes, as you can see on the picture to the side here, uh, can be very helpful. They have a 94% positive predictive value for some sort of abductor tendon pathology, whether that be a full thickness or partial thickness tendon tear. We also found that increased width of the pelvis is a contributor to abductor tendon pathology. And I think you really have to get good at looking at your MRI scan you know, our radiology colleagues are excellent, uh, but oftentimes they're more cued into labral pathology and other things, uh, and they don't look at the abductors nearly as much. And due to the trochanteric geometry, it can be a very confusing site to look at. Um, and so we have an arthroscopy techniques uh, video that might be worth uh, also looking at. My treatment algorithm for simple side of hip pain is if they have limp, weakness or lateral enthesophyte, I tend to get an MRI scan right away. And if it's a full thickness tendon tear, I think that that's best treated with surgical intervention. Shane No and others have shown that if you get more fatty infiltration in the abductor tendons, you get more retraction, these patients just don't do as well. And so if it's a full thickness tendon tear in a patient that's an amenable to surgical fixation, then I tend to just fix it. If it's a partial thickness tear, conservative management, and that can consist of non steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, making sure the rest of their lower extremity gait function is okay, stretching out the the IT band, strengthening the abductors, core, and lower back, and then you see how they do. If they do well, wonderful. If they don't do well, then these are very amenable to suture compression bridge technique. Uh, if they don't have uh, limp weakness or lateral enthesophyte, uh, then we tend to just do conservative management as we discussed before. If that fails, then we get the MRI scan and again, look for partial, partial versus full thickness tendon tears. So what are our options for partial thickness tendon tears? So surgically, you can do a debridement and a micropuncture. Um, these are difficult to perform and the reason is most of these partial thickness tears are on the deep surface. So they're under surface tears and so debridement is very difficult without taking down the intact bursal side. Transtendinous repair technique, um, 
trans tendinous, you basically make an incision longitudinal to the fibers of the abductor, and you can kind of debride the tendon underneath. You lose a little tendon with this technique, and then you kind of pull uh, anterior fibers posterior and posterior fibers anterior, which uh, isn't the anatomic site of their insertion. And then there's a takedown and repair, which works really well in the rotator cuff. In the abductor tendon, the insertion sites or the tendinous length is such that if you take down the tendon and you lose tendon, oftentimes you're tendon deficient for your full thickness repair. The transtendinous knotless compression bridge, this is my preferred technique. Uh, you keep the cortical bone so you have nice strong fixation. You're able to do the micropuncture technique which will allow egress of marrow cells and help the, the tendon heal. And you're able to tension your tendon down nicely. You can do a single row or double row. For my abductor tendons, I tend to leave the IT band intact. I think the TFL is a uh, secondary abductor. And to take down the IT band I think is a mistake unless they have overt snapping. So pearls for abductor tendon endoscopy. So the first few of these are just to kind of make sure our visualization is good. Um, so epi in the bags. Um, I like hypotension for my anesthetic, so systolic's under 100. I use tranexamic on these patients. Um, I run the pump a little bit higher than my central compartment and peripheral compartment arthroscopy. I use a 5-0 Arthrex trocar for my inflow, just so I can get more water in there. And if I'm not cannulating a portal, I make the portal extremely small so there's no egress of fluid. I abduct the leg. Abducting the leg increases the potential space in the trochanteric compartment by moving moving the IT band away from the abductors. I tilt the table away from me uh, during the operating room so you have better posterior access. Uh, and I also rotate the leg in several different positions to optimize uh, instrumentation and uh, equipment use. I also love the trimic cannulas for this. Uh, if you use a non-trimic cannula, oftentimes I'm dealing with cannulas kind of popping out and having harder issues. Uh, with the trimic, they stay true every time and you can kind of dial in the proper length for that patient. Portal placement, uh, so the first thing I do is I localize the vastus tubercle on x-ray. My first portal is the distal lateral accessory portal. I use a 70 degree scope for this whole, whole procedure. And basically it's just in front of the IT band. Um, I cannulate that portal and then basically sweep away the bursal tissue put the 70 degree scope in and then I percutaneously make a modified proximal anterior lateral portal, which is usually just a couple centimeters distal and in the same anterior posterior plane as my DLAP portal. You just wanna make sure you're not sword fighting so your hands are kind of far enough away from one another that they're not hitting each other when you're doing your instrumentation. At that point in time, I do a thorough bursectomy. I visualize our pathology and then the trimic cannulas are placed in modified portals with direct percutaneous um, visualization uh, to make sure that you have the absolute perfect trajectory uh, toward the trochanter I oftentimes will use radiographs for this as well. So repair steps, so you put in your trimic cannulas, you put in your 2-6 uh, uh, knotless fiber tacks, uh, both anterior and posterior. You're gonna have a shuttle suture and a repair suture in each. And then the next step is basically you take the repair stitch from the posterior through the anterior portal and vice versa. You then load that repair stitch in each portal through the looped shuttle suture pulled to the other side of the loop shuttle suture, bring the contralateral a repair stitch through the anchor, which will get you compression, and then you repeat the same steps on the other side. And again, the nice thing about this is it's adjustable tension, so you can really paste these tendons nicely down to bone. We have a nice new Arthrex convenience kit um, that has everything you need to perform these. Very simple and easy for your OR staff, it's seamless. This is a cadaveric video by Dr. Dome showing him micropuncture, uh, the area to be repaired. Uh, he then puts in his uh, knotless fiber tacks. He's now crossing the sutures, the repair stitch. So he's taking the anterior one through the posterior and the posterior one through the anterior. He'll then put it through the looped end of the shuttle suture and then pull it down nice and tight. And then you get a nice compression of that tendon tissue just below. Use your, your cutter and then you've got a nice, uh, nice compression bridge there. So what are the advantages to this? To me, it's minimally invasive. It's very simple to do through an endoscope. Uh, there's no loss of any tendon. It maximizes compression of tendon down to bone. You have absolutely strong fixation in the bone because you're not having to decorticate this bone. You just use small little micro punctures. There's a very small pilot hole. There's no knots, which minimizes uh, irritation to the IT band. And there's multiple different suture configurations you can do if you do a double row. So my experience with this, I've done over about 20 of these. Overall patient satisfaction's in the eight to nine range. We have not had any revisions. And again, I just can't uh, speak to how simple this is, reproducible this is, and it has great fixation strength. I haven't had any uh, anchors pull out. One thing that I was worried about when putting all suture anchors into the greater trochanter was suture fixation strength, and this nice systematic review basically showed that it was as good or better than traditional suture anchors. Thank you very much.